Hey guys, finishing up theater history. Um, I had to turn on a light because I couldn't see anymore. And drinking so healthy for me, Dr. Pepper. Um, all right. Revolutions, Romanticism to Postmodern Experiment. This is chapter 13. And um, starting in two weeks, we will uh, go back and catch up um, on all of the, what I call the practical things um, in the middle chapters. All right. Once artists grew weary of neoclassism, they found the form so entrenched that a revolution was necessary to dislodge it. Romanticism, a rejection of nearly every aspect of neoclassicism and a celebration of the natural world, was hardly itself a generation old when it came under serious challenge. In retrospect, the Romantic Rebellion seems to have opened a Pandora's box. As each movement wins acceptance, another is formed to rebel against it. Unlike neoclassicism, Aspects of the Romantic movement, as well as many other major movements to follow, continue to wield their influence on the theatrical professions that we currently practice and enjoy. Romanticism. The artistic and social movement of Romanticism, which is so strongly associated with the 19th century, actually began in the 18th. It became the dominant style in both acting and playwriting in the first half of the 19th century. The first strains of theatrical romanticism can be found in Germany among, ye uh, among young, rebellious theorists and playwrights who were sick of the limitations, the strict form and moral teachings of neoclassicism. The rebels sought to overturn this monolith of art and culture. Pre-romantic playwrights who called themselves Sturm and Drang or Storm and Stress deliberately broke all the rules of neoclassicism. The Sturm and Dranger shocked their audiences with plays full of violence and forbidden topics, such as teen pregnancy, rape, self-mutilation, and, um, yes. One of the most successful and disturbing of these plays, The Tutor, in 1774 by Jacob Lenz, presents a young tutor who seduces his even younger student and later, filled with guilt, castrates himself. Heinrich Wagner's The Child Murderess in 1776 begins with the rape of a girl by a soldier. The girl runs away, discovers she is pregnant, has a child, goes mad, and kills the baby. Don't we all want to see these kind of shows? Um, these dramatic iconoclasts were soon followed by the Romantics, led by theorist August von Schlegel, who wanted more than rebellion. The Romantics wished to replace neoclassical structure with organic structure. Form should be dictated by subject matter, not classical precedent, they argued. The Romantics were fascinated with the wild forces of nature, with the unexplainable, the gothic and mystical, and looked for correspondence between their beliefs and those of the Elizabethans, the Spanish Golden Age, and even the medieval world. The Germans, led by Schlegel, soon translated Shakespeare into their own language, and many other countries followed during the 19th century. Romantic playwrights in Germany created both funny and disturbing works. Ludwig Tieck's fairy tale extra extravaganza Puss in Boots in 1797 is a comical metatheatrical play, a self-referencing play that presents the theater as a theater, in which the audience takes a major role as the characters argue romantic versus neoclassical principles before the play self-destructs. A haunting, disturbing vision permeates Heinrich von Kleist's play such as Penthalacia in, in 1808, in which an Amazon warrior on the battlefield eats out the heart of the man she loves. Hmm. Later, she suggests that there is little difference in biting and kissing. Kissing, we often do one, she claims, which uh, when we mean the other. All right. Two German playwrights, Johann von Goethe and Frederick Schiller, who begin their theatrical work with the Sturm und Drang movement, are associated with the Romantic movement, although Goethe denied connections. What Goethe and Schiller accomplished with their playwriting and production work at the Court Theater of Weimar is labeled Weimar classicism. classicism. They combined ancient classics and stories with Romantic sensibilities and created remarkable interpretations of familiar work. France resisted the Romantic movement for a time remaining neoclassical under Napoleon and beyond, while the rest of Europe succumbed to the intoxication of Romanticism. It arrived amid great consternation in Paris when performers of Victor Hugo's 
Hernani in 1830 resulted in vociferous argument, demonstrations, and near rioting in the audience since the play deliberately violated every principle of neoclassicism. Hugo's romantic theory, which adds the idea of the grotesque to the romantic vision, is more significant than his plays. The character Quasimodo from Hugo's novel Notre Dame of Paris can stand as an image of the entire romantic movement, a beautiful spirit trapped in a grotesque body. Romanticism was very popular in the United States and found curious expression in many plays. Metamora in 1829 is a tragedy by John Augustus Stone, for example, featured Native American characters sympathetically as the center of the action. In the romantic language of the day, any aboriginal race was portrayed as the noble savage, a race destined, it was thought, to be removed or destroyed by the encroachment of civilized white settlers in ever-increasing numbers. Although a few Indians appeared in plays of the 1830s, it was not until after mid-century that Native Americans began to be routinely characterized as alcoholics and vicious villains in plays. Unfortunately, this stereotype has persisted to our own time. That sucks. Beginning in the early 19th century, each country that boasted a popular professional theater developed a number of touring stars. Actors and actresses who usually toured alone and performed with local companies throughout Europe and North America. Actors such as the American Edwin Booth uh, is one of the biggest stars of the entire century, toured internationally with both melodrama and Shakespearean tragedy. It was soon evident that the test of any male actor of the era was the role of Hamlet, even Mel Gibson. Although other tragic figures such as Othello, Macbeth, Lear, and Richard III were considered mandatory roles for most stars. Staging and designing in the Romantic era included the box set, a scenic device that imitated the interior of a room with walls, furniture, and visual detail. This kind of scenery was very important to actors, moving their performances away from the apron and within the walls of the set. After a time, actors were no longer playing just in front of the scenery. They were inside the box. We do not know who invented the box set, but it was popularized by actress manager Madame Vestris in... Um, England and North American tours beginning about 1830. Also associated with Vestris was the work of James Robinson Planch, um, who introduced antiquarianism, the creation of historically accurate costumes and scenery. It's one thing to read these, it's another thing to say them. Um, to the stage in the 1820s. This idea of dressing characters and recreating locations as they would appear at the time indicated by plays was at first a novelty. For centuries, actors had traditionally costumed themselves in clothes that were contemporary with their own time, regardless of the age or time setting of the place. That's very interesting to me. Antiquarianism became a new model for design. Historical accuracy obviously continues to be important to many directors, actors, and designers of our own day. The Romantic era also ushered in the first known professional African-American theater, the African-American... I'm sorry, the African Company in 1821 in New York. 19th century melodrama. The dramatic form that dominated the 19th century and continues to dominate in television and film is melodrama. This form became the most popular application of romanticism and, later, earlier types of realism. Many variations of the formula for melodrama were created in the 19th century, and most of them continue to be re reworked in our own time. Disaster epics on land and sea, from volcanic eruptions to tenement fires to shipwrecks. Um, crime and detective thrillers, supernatural horror stories, American West shootouts, tales of adventure in exotic locales, everyday domestic conflicts featuring love and divorce, reprieve from alcoholism, and an endless parade of villainous big businessmen, lawyers, and outlaws. Mali. A very important change occurred during the reign of stage and melodrama. In the 1820s, along with many other spectacular devices, gaslight was introduced to the stage. It quickly replaced candles and oil lamps, even though it was volatile and dangerous. Gaslight produced greater intensity of light and could easily be dimmed up and down. Nighttime scenes could for the first time be dark and shadowy. Blackouts were possible and colored lights could use... Uh, and colored light using silks and glass could be projected in dynamic ways. It was also possible to put the audience in the dark, thus altering its behavior and making it quieter and more focused on the stage, like it is today. 
Lowering of the house lights did not occur until the late century, late until late in the century, however. Spectacle became very literal and was aided by remarkable inventions applied to the stage. Conveyor belts that transported gliding ghosts and racing horses and wagons. Hydraulic and electric lifts that created bridges and levels high in the air. Three-dimensional scenery that replaced some of the flat painted scenery, traps, and walls that enabled some sudden entrances of vampires, collapsible scenery for earthquakes and fires. Many devices that we now associate with realism or special effects for film from James Bond to Harry Potter, from Mission Impossible to Lord of the Rings, were first developed for the spectacles of stage melodrama. The pod race in Star Wars, Episode One, for example, is an, uh, is an updating of Ben-Hur's Roman chariot race, but such chariot races were first done on stage, not film. The team of W.S. Gilbert and Arthur Sullivan satirized melodrama in wildly successful melodramatic comic operatas such as HMS Pinafore in 1878, in the Pirates of Penzance in 1879. Although many musical forms appeared on the stage in the 19th century, the plays and music of Gilbert and Sullivan provides hints for the modern musical, which in the 20th century frequently adopted devices and techniques from the operata form. It was also in the first production of Gilbert and Sullivan's Patience that electric light was introduced to the theater in 1881. 19th century realism and naturalism. Realism was a rebellion against romanticism and melodrama. So many rebellions. But at the same time, a realization of what romanticism and melodrama had approached visually, a very detailed evocation of scenery and costume along lines of historical and contemporary accuracy. Whereas French melodramatic playwrights in the 1850s, such as um, Alexandre Dumas, Fitz were, attempt were attempting to move the subject matter of plays in a more realistic direction. The first fully realistic plays are usually credited to Norwegian Henrik Ibsen. His influential A Doll House in 1879 centers on a wife leaving her husband and children. And Ghosts in 1881 broached the forbidden topic of sexually transmitted disease. Ibsen and the other realists were inspired by a scientific revolution that increasingly looked at the human being not as the center of the universe, but as another subject for scientific study. One of these scientists, Charles Darwin, in on his in his On the Origin of Species by means of natural selection in 1859, created a firestorm with his version of evolutionary theory. For Darwin and other thinkers, such as Herbert Spencer, the first sociolo sociologist to apply evolutionary theory to social development in the 1850s, the importance of heredity and environment was deemed critical to all animal life. Playwrights such as Ibsen begin to use heredity and environment in their plays as strong determinants of human character and behavior. It was not just biological evolution that fascinated artists, but cultural and social evolution as well. The importance of environment to character behavior extended to create settings that were not just authentic in every detail, but also connected to the characters who worked or lived in them. Many of the physical trappings of realism had been developed earlier by the Romantics through such things as antiquarianism and the box set, but new realists labor to connect space to character and event both in production and in the written play texts. The realists insisted on creating conversational dialogue that avoided, uh, that avoided the poetic and included repetition, inane remarks, pauses, and imperfect responses to imitate the way people really speak and interact in everyday life. The subject matter of realism often disturbed audiences and critics um, the most. Frank oh my gosh, frank discussions of prostitution, adultery and divorce, and treatment of monumental social problems in marriage, rights for women, and the plight of the working class. With realism, the theater became a forum for current volatile social issues that could not that could polarize the audience. Unlike the Romantics, Ibsen did not try to change everything at once in his plays but utilized easily recognized structure that remained popular throughout the Romantic era, melodrama, and the well-made play. At the conclusion of his plays, however, he did not provide an easy solution or a happy ending, thus throwing his audiences into a tailspin. When Nora walked out on her husband and children at the end of a dollhouse, it was more than many audiences could stand. Some even demonstrated and waited for Nora to return. 
Early realists whose plays are still regularly revived quickly followed Ibsen's techniques and challenged their audiences to face their own social and personal demons. George Bernard Shaw in England wrote Mrs. Warren's Profession, produced in 1902, in which a former prostitute, now a madam, must explain her early life choices to her incredulous daughter, in effect defending logically her decision to become a prostitute in order to haul herself out of poverty. In the United States, the title character of James Hearns' play, Margaret Fleming, in 1890, discovers that her husband has had an affair with and impregnated a poor woman whom he abandoned. Margaret shocked audiences by rejecting her husband and taking the orphan baby of the wronged woman as her own. She even prepared to nurse the baby on stage, an act that for some audiences was the most shocking of all. Unlike Ibsen, Shaw, and Hearn, some playwrights wanted to throw out traditional structure as well. In 1880, Emile Zola in France called for naturalism, in which playwrights should create a slice of life following the actual pace of everyday life, in short, imitating novels of the period. Many playwrights, in fact, began to think of themselves as novelists of the stage. Such an approach was very difficult to take without boring an audience, but several playwrights came very close to the ideal. They avoided central characters and created a collective hero or focused the action on a group. For example, the Russian play The Cherry Orchard in 1904 by Anton Chekhov follows the demise of a wealthy family when its members fail to recognize the social and economic changes going on around them. They end by losing the things that seem to mean the most to them, but they do nothing to prevent the loss. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, most productions of realistic and naturalistic plays were presented in independent theaters, which for a number of years operated outside the sphere of commercial theater and government censorship. The first of these was the Theater Libre, founded by um, André Antone in Paris in 1887. Antone's work and that of Konstantin Stanislavski at the Moscow Theater a Moscow Art Theater, beginning in 1898, created a climate for a radical change in acting style, as well as a love among many young and developing actors for the new realism and naturalism. The new acting model was not the romantic, the, was not the romantic touring star, but the actor who worked in an ensemble and created character through the close observation of real life, careful examination of character history and motivation, and psychological evaluation. This shift is the apparent beginning of actors psychoanalyzing characters as if they were real people. Urged to do so by directors from Antone onward, actors created the impression that the audience was not present during the performance, creating an imaginary fourth wall at the proscenium curtain line. The change must have been startling. Much of what we associate with contemporary directing was created as a response to the need for careful control of the realistic presentation. So. I think you guys understand that, but basically, um, you can break the fourth wall where you're interacting with the audience and the audience interacts with you, or there's a fourth wall where basically um, the audience is looking in, but the performance does not involve the audience, at least not directly. The avant-garde from the late 19th century to the 1960s. Two important terms that have been associated with theater since the late 19th century sometimes lead to confusion since they are used in various ways. Modernism and the avant-garde are closely identified with the 20th century. Modernism in theater is often used to designate the shift between um, the shift beginning with realism. Throughout the 20th century, scholars noted that modern theater and drama began with Ibsen. In this book, we will use the term modernism to refer to both early realistic and much non-realistic theater from the late 19th century to the present day. Avant-garde is also a complicated term and often is used synonymously with the term experiment. Originally a French military term meaning vanguard, the front line of troops who are the first to engage the enemy, it was appropriated by artists to signify those who venture into new unknown territory in the arts. By definition, Art that is avant-garde cannot remain so for very long. The work either fails or it succeeds. The term avant-garde, however, is typically a label for experimental work that rebelled against realism and naturalism. Beginning in the 1890s, non-realistic and anti-realistic theater and drama appeared regularly in many different artistic movements and experiments which continued almost non-stop through the 1960s. Sometimes the avant-garde shocked or surprised. It experimented with subject matter, dramatic form, and staging techniques. 
Experimenters challenged values in the moral order or often attempted to posit a new way of viewing the world. They were fascinated with dreams, the unconscious, psychoanalysis, alternative realities, the supernatural, and irrationality. Symbolism in the 1890s and early 20th century was the first major challenging was the first major challenge to realism. Its leading playwright, Belgian Maurice Maeterlinck, created plays such as *The Bluebird* in 1908, a symbolic pursuit of elusive happiness. The legacy of symbolism is still very much alive in theater for children. Disney films and many romantic musicals, such as *The Fantastics* in 1960, which presents a simple story of love found, lost, and found again with emblematic characters in imaginary scenery on a nearly empty stage. Many in the avant-garde were fascinated with, with, the, with the possibilities of the relatively bare stage of some Asian theater. This east-west fasc fascination was a two-way street, with Asian practitioners appropriating Western melodrama, realism, and the proscenium stage. Touring companies from both hemispheres visited foreign theaters. Also intrigued by Asian forms, August Strindberg in Sweden created not only realism but also bizarre dramas such as A Dream Play in 1907, which abandons causality as an organizing principle and substitutes dream or music as a model for form. Time and space shift suddenly in defiance of logic or causality just as in our dreams. New directors such as Lugin Po in France attempted to create an abstract stage focusing on color or substituting drapes for traditional scenery. Poe, or maybe it's Poe, directed plays by Maeterlinck as well as one of the most famous outrageous plays of the avant-garde, Ubu Roy, or King Ubu, by Alfred Jerry, a play that in 1896 seemed designed to offend everyone with its stupid anti-hero, skate, uh, skatological jokes, and runaway violence. The first word of the play, um, one that is subsequently repeated persistently is merdre, a fabricated word resembling the French word for crap, which caused the first audiences to erupt in a mixture of outrage and delight. I've, I had to read this actually for a, my text analysis that I had in my graduate program, and it's, uh, it's definitely interesting. Designers, too, joined the rebellion in the majestic but simple designs of Adolf Appiah, and Gordon Craig swept the theatrical world with their images of platforms, stairs, open spaces, and great, even impossible heights. A guiding principle was simplicity, avoiding detail and reducing a location to its most significant elements. In the United States, this was called the new stagecraft, and it quickly made its way into commercial theaters. Sometimes such scenery was used even for plays that were written to be realistic. Experimental directors and designers took on Shakespeare and other classics anew and sought to return to a simple stage where the space could suggest any location without filling the space with detailed, realistic scenery. As Shakespeare had been the test for actors in the 19th century, his plays became the measure of directors in the 20th. Harley Granville Barker in England eliminated the traditional forest scenery of A Midsummer Night's Dream and replaced it with open platforms and diaphanous drapery. German and American Expressionism in the 1910s and 20s dramatized the dehumanization of de deconstruction and humanity at the hands of industry and war. And war. Written long before Hiroshima, George Kaiser's Gas II in 1920 presents an um, apocalyptic sorry, view of an entire culture wiped out by a superweapon. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, guys. Apocalyptic. I don't know why that threw me off. Apocalyptic. Um, view of an entire culture wiped out by a super weapon. A principal effect of anti-realistic theater and drama was to dramatize and make concrete or objectify an internal or figurative thought, idea, feeling, or imaginative event. French surrealism, such as Jean Cocteau's Orpheus in 1926, reconceived Greek mythology in an attempt to combine the dream world so completely with the real world that one could hardly distinguish the two. Two avant-garde innovators whose important work was created between the two world wars had a profound impact on the rest of the century. Bertolt Brecht in Germany popularized epic theater through th theory and his Marxist plays such as Mother Courage and Her Children in 1939. 
an episodic journey in which the title character loses her children to the ravages of war and her own preoccupation with capitalist practice. Epic theater is anti-illusionist theater featuring emotional detachment, narration, songs, and obvious theatricality. It has been adopted and adapted by countless directors and playwrights. In France, Antonin Artaud was not very successful as an actor and director, but his theory of the theater of cruelty from the 1930s um, is still considered required reading by many avant-garde artists of the theater. Artaud's theory is focused on personal rather than social changes and advocates working on emotions by assaulting the audience's senses. He stressed process over product and visual imagery over text. Many avant-garde artists since the 1950s have created work inspired by both Brecht and Artaud. World War II left artists disturbed by its horrors, especially the Holocaust and the atomic bomb. Artists of the avant-garde created a body of work dominated by play centered on characters who are strangers to each other, trapped in a violent, meaningless world seemingly without design or purpose. Such plays are often dubbed theater of the absurd. The bleak, existential, repetitious world of Samuel Beckett in Waiting for Godot in 1953 is a study of tramps on a road awaiting something or someone that never arrives continues to haunt theaters around the world. During the era of the Vietnam War, the avant-garde in Europe and the United States was preoccupied with communal performance groups, environmental staging, and angry political messages. Jerzy Grotowski's Polish Laboratory Theater became an international phenomenon with environmental productions such as Ac um, Acropolis. Anything that has an O tonight, I'm just botching. In 1962, a stylized examination of survival and death in concentration camps. Grotowski led an ensemble of actors with a near-religious dedication to their projects. The Living Theater in the 1950s and early 1960s was an off-off Broadway collective experiment led by Judith Molina and Julian Beck, but by the mid-1960s, this company functioned as a group of radical expatriate Americans wandering Europe with political production such as Paradise Now, which insisted on instant revolution. Modern and Contemporary Popular Theater in the 20th century, many theater artists found themselves both among the avant-garde and in the mainstream commercial theater. Eugene O'Neill in the United States produced many experimental dramas between 1916 and 1934, but some of his plays, such as The Emperor Jones, were commercial hits as early as 1920. This was the first professional production outside variety entertainment to present a black actor with white actors on a Broadway stage. Inspired by Strindberg, O'Neill created both realism and non-realism, but most of his late famous plays, such as The Iceman Cometh in 1946 and Long Day's Journey into Night in 1956, are strictly realistic. The realistic trend has continued unchecked since Ibsen. The realistic acting style, identified with Stanislavski, made its way to other countries in the early 20th century and received one of its most influential incarnations in the work of the Group Theater in New York in the 1930s. Hi, Molly. You want to say hi? Doggy break. Say hi. Hi, Moth. Hi. Hi. She's <laughs> like, what's going on? been talking for a long time, Mom. Okay, um, we were talking about the group theater. Yeah, this ensemble found its strongest expression in the Depression era plays of Clifford Odets, such as Awake and Sing in 1935, which depicts a hard-edged Jewish mother struggling to make ends meet and trying with little success to hold her family together. The group theater disbanded in 1941, and from the ashes of the defunct company, Elia Kazan and others created the Actors Studio in 1947. The Actors Studio was formed as a workshop for professional actors, many of whom, such as Geraldine Page and Marlon Brando, became household names. Other members of the group theater, such as Stella Adler and Sanford Meisner, became acting teachers whose methods continue at the center of many acting programs. Realism has persisted in the plays of famous and frequently revived playwrights. Arthur Miller in Death of a Salesman in 1949 gave us the exemplar of 20th century tragedy. 
Some of the most unforgettable American characters fill the plays of Tennessee Williams, such as A Streetcar Named Desire in 1947. In Glengarry Glen Ross in 1983, David Mamet demonstrates the business world out of control but presents it as a model for the American way of life. Without doubt, the most popular theater in both economic and crowd-pleasing terms of the 20th century has been the modern musical, dominated at first by the United States but now generated in many parts of the world. England's Andrew Lloyd Webber gave us Phantom of the Opera. In 1986, Elton John and Tim Rice created Aida in 2000 and Les Miserables in 1985 by Alan Balblil and Claude Michael Schoenberg originated in France. Musicals are sometimes categorized as a separate genre, but the musical is a play and can be of any genre, comedy, tragedy, or melodrama, and most theater before realism incorporated significant music, singing, and dance. The, mu the book musical, a play that tells a story and has spoken texts as well as songs, was inspired by 19th century operettas and has been dominated I'm sorry, has been dominant since the tragic comic Racially Mixed Showboat in 1927 by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II. The book musical peaked in sentimentality with the enormously popular efforts of Hammerstein and Richard Rogers beginning with Oklahoma in 1943. It then adapted tragic form with Bernstein's West Side Story in 1957, incorporated rock music with Jerome Ragney, James Rado, and Galt McDermott's Hair in 1967. Experimented with development of the musical form in Michael Bennett's A Chorus Line in 1975, which is dominated by dance because of the subject matter, reached some of its most sophisticated musical and structural efforts with Stephen Sondheim in such plays as Sunday in the Park with George in 1984, and tackled contemporary social, racial, and sexual issues in Rent in 1996 by Jonathan Larson and In the Heights in 2008 by Lin-Manuel Miranda and Chiara Allegria Hughes. Many of these accomplishments are hilariously parodied in Urine Town by Greg Codis and Mark Hallman in 2001 and Spamalot by Eric Idle and John Duprez in 2005. Although Passing Strange in 2008 by Stu and Heidi Rodewald also makes fun of performance art, the play is really a wonderful rock musical and geographical journey through Stu's personal experiences with international touring and the rock world. With Spring Awakening in 2006 by Stephen Sater and Duncan Sheik, the past and the present are united in a remarkable theatrical expression that engages a young audience while resonating with the residue of 19th century confrontational theater and troubling cultural conflicts. The recent avant-garde and postmodern experiment. Experimental work in the late in the last several decades of the 20th century has often been categorized as postmodern, which can be interpreted as work that is no longer modern, in the sense that August Strindberg and Tennessee Williams were modern. The postmodern is not of the modern, but comments on, satirizes, or reinterprets the modern. The postmodern artist is sometimes identified as artist and critic simultaneously. Some critics see it as an artistic style, hence postmodernism. Others claim that it is a mindset, a point of view that looks back on the previous century of artistic work with cynicism or futility and sometimes despair. In visual terms, it is dominated by simultaneous action in electronic or cybernetic technology. And structurally, it features repetition and deconstruction of masterpieces of the past. The last several decades, decades have witnessed considerable blurring of the avant-garde in commercial theater, so much so that some critics argue that the avant-garde died in the 1960s and refer to the experiment from 1890 to 1970 or so as the historical avant-garde. We will continue to use the term avant-garde for non-commercial experiment, but verified that experience, experiment since about 1970 has been very different from that which occurred before. In subject matter, many experimental plays have focused on gay and lesbian lifestyles and conflicts. A host of gender issues headed by feminism and the isolation of the individual in a self-centered world. Theatrical companies dedicated solely or primarily to gay and lesbian issues have been appearing since the 1970s. The company Split Britches, for example, deconstructs famous plays such as A Streetcar Named Desire in Belle Reprieve in 1981, a collaboration with the Blue Lips Production Company. Stanley Kowalski is replaced by a lesbian and Blanche Dubois by a man in a dress. Gay material has been mainstreamed, of course, most notably with Angels in America in 1991 by Tony Kushner. 
Feminist issues have been a dynamic part of experimental work since the 1970s, when many women's acting companies and female playwrights proliferated in North America, Britain, and Germany. Audiences have been challenged by Carol Churchill's comic and disturbing Top Girls in 1982, a scathing examination of gender issues in the business world. In the 1990s, playwright Eve Ensler began performing the Vagina Monologues, based on her interview with many women. The play initiated the V-Day movement in 1998 to stop violence against women and girls worldwide. These playwrights and others have introduced new and exciting types of dramatic structures. Because so many artists have been preoccupied with gender issues in the last few decades, we have seen an explosion of cross-dressing on the stage, a whole new wave of gender-bending tied to sexual politics. Sarah Rules the Clean House in 2006 is one of the most remarkable American plays to emerge amidst postmodern work. It explores on a domestic front issues of intercultural and linguistic confusion, the mysteries of shifting romantic relationships even in middle age, and the power and fears of confronting death and loss in the midst of telling jokes. Many postmodern directors have deconstructed classics of the stage with startling revelations. Um, imbuing old plays from Greek tragedy to Gilbert and Sullivan comic operettas with contemporary political contexts. contexts. Deconstruction in theatrical production means a radically reinterpreted famous play in which the original play may still be recognized. The new production, however, uses the written play as only a pretext and frequently comments on or negates the apparent intent of the original play. Wholly new work, dominated by visual images, dynamic music and dance, or closely choreographed movement, has become the hallmark for many conceptual directors, such as Martha Clark, who conceived Vienna Lustos in 1986 with text by Charles Mead Jr. and created a culture at the crossroads primarily through visuals. Robert Wilson is also a master of visual images in his combined minimalistic and postmodern music by Philip Glass and David Byrne, with remarkable designs and movements in vast projects such as the Civil, all capitalized, Wars, with a capital S, in 1983. One of the most intriguing postmodern artists is Tadashi Suzuki in 1939 from Japan. Suzuki combines different periods, cultures, and styles with international casts of actors trained in the martial arts for his experiments, such as Clitemenstra, a reworking of Greek tragedy. Prominent among postmodern trends at the end of the 20th century was solitary work of performance artists utilizing media and direct audience address. Karen Finley, one person, Karen Finley's one-person semi-autobiographical shows are confrontational and controversial, using nudity and strong political and social messages, such as, um, as in "We Keep Our Victims Ready" in 1989. Spalding Gray gave his audience the convincing impression that his monologues, such as "Monster in a Box" in 1991, are entirely autobiographical and embarrassingly revealing of his psychological problems. In a post-9-11 world, many theater artists, not surprisingly, are preoccupied with terrorism and all of its potential fallout from threats to personal liberty to wide-ranging governments and freelance organizations that threaten to enshrine totalitarian practice in acts of uh, programmatic suicide and genocide. The Cold War is long over, but many of its components have been resurrected, sometimes in surprising places. The personal expression of some theater artists comments um, meaningfully on the state of the world that many people find confusing or alarming. Neil Lamboot in The Shape of Things in 2001 asks us to question the morality of exploiting others for the sake of art and of drawing focus to the artist rather than the art. Can or should the artistic expression outstrip the personality of the artist? Some performance artists claim that the body of the artist and the art are the same thing. Is such a point of view residue of a dying postmodern movement or a verification of what theatrical experiment will become for the next generation? The theatrical future is all but impossible to predict, but historians and critics a few years beyond us will recognize the clues in our current practice. They lie in the new plays that we write and produce, in the plays from the past that we choose to revive, and in how we interpret those revivals. Although change is inevitable, it is equally certain that plays and performances of the past will continue to inspire new art and be themselves reworked and adapted to meet the demands and desires of future audiences. Some of you who are reading this book will be an important part of this change. Awesome stuff. 
All right. You have discussion boards due on Thursday and responses due on Saturday. Have a good week.